gonna spend a little bit of time talking about how we can automatically detect features from our remotely sensed data. And as well as that, um, how we do it now, but some opportunities we have to improve our workflow in the future. So my name's Owen and I'm a consultant working with uh, Envy, which is a software for retrieving this information. And I work with this every day. So uh, my job typically involves providing training, working with customers to implement bespoke workflows for them, anything which really lets them get the most from their imagery and add the most value to their business. So before I talk about the different ways in which we use Envy, I'm gonna focus a little bit, just give you a brief introduction into how, um, into what it can do, how we can use it. So one common example is change detection. So here we've got one image, which is actually taken from uh, Western Sumatra in Indonesia. So this first image was taken from spring 2004. And then we've got a second image of that same area, which was actually taken in January 2005. So just a matter of weeks after the tsunami which had affected that area. So it's quite common like this that I'll have two different images from the same area where something's happened in between. And I want some knowledge, some, um, some information about what's happened. And in this case, I want to do this change detection. I want to look at these two images and find out how much vegetation's actually been removed by the tsunami in this area. So I can run that through our change detection workflow and we could make it quite simplistic. You know, we've got multiple bands of information from our satellite. So we can look at just one band and look at how that difference has changed. But Envy actually lets us go that one step further as well and lets us find out how a specific feature has changed. So straight out the box, we can actually look at, we can calculate the vegetation on the fly, do that for both those images, and then work out how that's changed between the two times. And that could be provided back to us as an image. Maybe it's going to be a mask for something else we're going to use in our workflow. Or more likely, we just want the actual information itself. We want that digitized so we can either create a report on that or so we can use it in our GIS analysis. In this case, I'm looking for the amount of vegetation that's been removed from this scene. So I can just create a report on that in Envy and get that metric figure, how much vegetation has been removed, and I can report that directly to my users. Another very common example with this sort of data is land classification. How is land actually being used within an image? So I've got an image here of uh, Tokyo Harbour, and I'm interested in you know, what, are the, you know, what are the pieces of information which make up this image? Where are the roads? Where are the components of the harbour? Where's the deep water, shallow water? Where are the buildings? So I can actually run that through our land classification workflow. Same as before, creating a shapefile on the way because that's most likely to be my, um, my product, which I want to export to my customers. I want to give them this to use as part of their GIS analysis. And that's really the focus of Envy, is actually being able to find these pieces of information, stuff which traditionally you know, would be done by hand, maybe manually hand digitised, and save all that time, be able to produce this information, which we can then use in a GIS analysis. So in this case, I can cr uh, produce a shape file, which is fully attributed, and we can use that in any GIS platform which we wish. But in particular, we've got a great link up with Esri. So being able to produce information from images and then push that directly into ArcGIS software. So from Envy, we can actually export directly into ArcMap. Similarly, if we want to push into a geo database, it's just as straightforward. And we can use this to then create a report of how that land's being used. What, you know, how much of each of this image is buildings, how much of it's harbour. And typically we see that used places like CEH in the UK will use this. So both of those techniques are sort of really um, broad brush stroke ways of using data. But what if we're interested in more finer scale information from an image? We're not trying to classify an entire image or look at how it's changed. We're just looking for very specific features. And that's where we can use feature extraction. So in this case, I'm interested in Fallujah in Iraq. And I want, I want to identify where buildings are. I want to understand the limits of the building footprints and be able to use that as part of a GIS analysis. So I have my satellite image. And again, I run that through my feature extraction workflow. And what this does is this actually takes my satellite image and divides it up into a whole host of different segments. And each one of those segments has a whole um, range of attributes associated with it. Things like how round it is, how long it is, 
what sort of texture it has. So I can then apply rules to that image and say, OK, well, for buildings, I want it to fall within a certain size range. I need it to be quite rectangular, but not too elongated. So I can build up a rule set like this, and Envy will then be able to automatically identify which segments meet those requirements. And the beauty of that, of course, is that once I have this rule set, I can make that fully automatic. I can run any similar image straight through this routine, use that rule set, and really be able to reproduce those results. And again, of course, I might want to use this as a mask in another part of my workflow. But typically, I just want the shapefile, which I can then use as part of my GIS analysis. So those examples were really just using multispectral data. But I do just want to emphasize as well that we're sort of we're, um, ambiguous to data usage within NV. So we want to make it as easy as possible to use other modalities. So as well as just multispectral images, we also work with LiDAR. We work with SAR, which is Synthetic Aperture Radar, and Thermal as well. SAR is one which I think is going to be really interesting, really useful in the coming years as more sensors are coming online, particularly the Sentinel mission. So we'll see a lot of data coming down, which we can use that for. And SAR is really about timeliness. Um, we have a high repeat time of sampling areas. So we can see really small scale changes, such as subsidence. So I think that one will be really interesting. The image I have up on screen at the moment, though, this is a LiDAR image, which was used by the uh, US Forestry Commission. And what they're interested in was actually mapping areas and working out how susceptible they are to wildfire, areas that are in risk of burning. So you can see with LiDAR, it's a 3D mapping tool. So we get these really fine resolution 3D maps. And with Envy LiDAR, our LiDAR module, what we can actually do is extract where some of those features are. We can classify that whole LiDAR point cloud all of those points to identify things like trees, power lines, buildings. So it's really quite powerful. And we see that used quite a lot with some of our Scandinavian customers, where they have you know, large regions where they have power lines, where they're interested in where there's vegetation encroaching on those lines. But they might be quite remote, so it's very difficult for someone to actually go there and check on it. It's more efficient to actually have a LiDAR fly overhead and identify where this is happening. Also, of course, because the LiDAR is monitoring the surface as well, so we can extract these digital elevation models. And that was really the interest for the US Forestry Commission in this case, that what they're interested in is whereabouts, um, you know, what was the, uh, the surface model like? They wanted to extract a dem of this area to identify where there were areas where the fire would just spread uphill. So that's a little bit about things we can do with Envy, things that you know, we can do image analysis upon, things we can retrieve. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is a different way that we can work with Envy. So traditionally, we have you know, our machine in front of us, my laptop here, and we're using Envy locally here. We're performing our analysis on our machine in front of us. We have some local data associated with that. Perhaps we also have some network storage, which we're retrieving information from. But obviously, in order to do our analysis, we need some data, we need some imagery to actually look at. But how did we get that data? How did it get onto our laptop? How did it get to our local storage? Well, we've had to find out which area of the world we're interested in. Uh, we've then maybe had to connect if it's a commercial uh, instrument we're using. We've had to connect to their FTP site, find the image, find the correct time, and actually be able to retrieve that. And sometimes that we might have a larger geographic area that we're interested in processing. We might have a larger number of bands, more data than we actually need to use. So it can be quite time consuming to transfer all that data across and only be using a small fraction of it. So what I'm going to show you in a moment is a different way of approaching this. Instead of having our machine in front of us do all the processing, we're going to look at using enterprise technology. We look at moving that processing to the cloud. So in the demonstration I'm going to show you, all the technology I'm going to have on this machine running locally is just a web browser. And across in the cloud, we're going to have our new product called the Envy Services Engine, which instead of performing those analytics on the machine locally on the desktop, as with previous examples of Envy, which I've shown you, it's actually going to be performing them on the server somewhere, wherever that may be. And of course, we need some data to actually perform that analysis on. So I'll mention some more about that in just a moment. And we need some middleware, something which is actually going to retrieve, receive a request 
tell the service engine, go ahead, do your processing, and then be able to return that, return that information to us because we've got a question we want answered. We want to get the answer back. So the data that we're going to use, in this case, we're going to use some of Esri's image services. We're going to use their Landsat image services to retrieve some data as we need it. We're going to be querying their catalog and just retrieving the data that we need to perform an analysis on. And this is just one example of the way you can set this up. Uh, you might have your own local data. Um, so this is, it's not the perfect solution, it's just a way of um, moving into this cloud-based technology. So what I have here is a web page. On the left-hand side, you can see that I've got a list of services which are available to me, services which I can query, I can retrieve imagery for. So the ones which I want to draw your attention to are Landsat 1 to 7 and also Landsat 8. So I can retrieve tiles of that information on the fly. Wherever that's stored by Esri, I've got no idea. I just know that I can connect to it by a web service, query what they've got, and retrieve the bits of those tiles that I need. In the middle, we have a map, and the map is simply just providing context. It's showing our user, you know, this is the area we're looking at, this is the area which you're going to retrieve data for and perform analysis on. And in fact, you can see as I move the map around, I've got a list of tiles underneath. So that's actually showing me which Landsat tiles are available, which ones will I want to choose to perform analysis on. Because obviously the timeliness might be important to me as well. I might need to have my, um, my processing performed at a very specific time. And I think the bit which I really want to show you on the right hand side, which you won't be able to make out from there, you, we have a lot of different image processing tasks. So all the good stuff which has been in Envy, all the stuff which has been in Envy for you know, 20, 25 years now, which is well known, well used, and well defined, we've exposed as much of that as possible as these services. So when you have this service engine, you don't have to write everything for yourself. We have a lot of functionality available straight out the box. So if you've got a really well defined workflow on the desktop in Envy, then you can move quite readily to this service environment and really make the most of that process being well formed, well founded. So, for instance, here we are in London today. And there we have Regent's Park and Hyde Park, which I'm sure are very nice this afternoon. I can just run some simple analysis on that. I want to take this scene of London and I want to find out where there's vegetation, which areas are made up of uh, vegetative areas. So what's happened there, when I actually I selected the data which I want to run my analysis on, and then I said I want to run this NDVI analysis. So the request was created by this web page. The request went across to the server, wherever every service engine was. In this case, I can tell you that it's just it's an Amazon web instance, but this could be anywhere. This could be you know, somewhere which is available across the internet, or it can be local to your intranet, so it's very flexible. That actually carried out the analysis, retrieved that Esri image service data, calculated what our, you know, what our analytics were, calculated this NDVI for us, and then returned it and displayed it in the browser. So because none of the processing was actually done on my laptop, this could have been done on a smartphone, it could have been done on a tablet, we don't need that heavy processing, we can just use a thin client. So it's really powerful for being able to deliver analytics to people out in the field, um, people who don't have you know, complicated licensing. So if we're trying to get some analytics to our customers, we can get them directly doing the processing. So all this is returned. It's just a scale from white to green. You can see the areas in dark green, the high vegetation. So I can see our London parks there. And in fact, we can see all those individual little squares, those nice squares that make up London. It'd be a nice place to be this afternoon. So that's just a simple example, just to give you that idea of how we're not doing the processing locally. We're making that request to somewhere, and then we're getting our answer back. A little bit more of a detailed example. If I look at Mafrak in Jordan. And just along this road, there's actually a refugee camp, which is, uh, it didn't even exist a few years ago. And now it's the fourth largest city in, in uh, Jordan, where people are actually fleeing over the border from Syria. 
I think last year there was maybe 130,000 people there. But it's such a recent development that we don't have any clue about it in our map. So if I were to look at my Landsat 8 service, which is some more recent data in it, and I can look at something from quite recently, so this is the 7th of May 2015. And I can just run a simple land classification on this. Just tell me what sort of classes make up this area. So again, I've selected the data, I've formed that request using this web browser, and that request has just gone to the server up on the Amazon cloud, which is then going to carry out the analytics, retrieve the data, and then give us back our answer. So this is quite a straightforward example. What we've done there was just done a classification of urbanized areas, and I could then use that to actually compare with my map and identify where this urbanized area is, which doesn't appear on the map. And because of this high repeat time from the Landsat data, I can actually see how that changes over time. I can look at that, I can download the data itself. So I could actually do this analysis remotely and then retrieve the data and carry out more analysis on it, or in fact, just generate a shapefile and retrieve that locally. So it's a great way of combining different technologies. And in fact, in this case, I have an idea of where urbanized areas are, but of course, I might be looking for something specific this is a very large refugee camp, so they're using very particular tents. So I could actually look for that spectral signature, maybe provide some training data, and identify specifically where that urbanized area is. And there's one other example I'd like to show you, which is just a little bit more complicated. So obviously, if we look to Dubai, there's a lot of um, development work that's happened there in the last 10 years or so. And from this Landsat imagery, we've got a fantastic historical record so we might be interested in where there's been new developments, where there's been change between one time and another one. So I can look here and see that, in fact, we've got these world islands in Dubai, which I know didn't exist a few years ago. So let's try running that through our change detection workflow. What would we expect to see? So for my time one, I have an image taken from 2000. And for time two, a more recent image, which was taken in October 2010. So I'm supplying what those two times are. I'm supplying the area. And exactly the same as before, the request is sent across the server which is going to then retrieve those two different data sets. And remember, it's not retrieving the entire tile from Landsat, it's just retrieving the information that we need. And it's then going to be able to perform that analysis and then send us back what our answer is. So again, this is just a demonstration implementation of that sort of technology. The way which we can make uh, use of the new software which we have available, this, you know, this more web-based technology. So it really is a powerful way of combining these different sorts of technology together. So I really hope that's just some food for thought to think about some different ways which we can actually use cloud technologies rather than just being limited to the desktop. There's no issue with this traditional approach of working on the desktop. Obviously, it's not going anywhere. And we always need that to be able to really test our routines, to test our workflow, and to make sure that we're actually um, doing things well-rounded and we're really getting the results which we want. But the benefits which this approach can bring us, it means that we can actually run on large data sets because instead of taking all of the data, we're just retrieving the data which we need, the data for our area of interest. If we think of something like hyperspectral images, maybe they'll have hundreds and hundreds of bands, but for our analysis, we require um, maybe only 10, 20 of them. So we can just retrieve the data that we specifically need. And obviously, the other advantage to this is, you've seen that I've been running this locally on my laptop so I've just been running this directly from a web browser. So there's been no special licensing. There's been no need to have any other technology installed. It means that our customers can just directly access this sort of analytics and use it themselves.